Hello everybody, this is Antonio Wolf. Do you like violence? Do you want to hear me read the fourth political theory about cultural islands? You do? Well, good for you. Uh, today we're reading Alexander Dugan's The Fourth Political Theory. Uh, here with me, uh, it's a assortment of my uh, usual and unusual friends. Ooh, where does it start? Well, I guess we'll start with chapter one and two. So, uh, Dugan is like connected to Putin, right? As far as I know. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I doubt it's because uh, Putin actually cares about the theory, but uh, he probably sees it as a way to uh, bolster whatever position he has. Yeah. Chapter 1. Introduction. To be or not to be. I would read this <clears throat> with some shitty Russian-American accent, but uh, I can't do that. You can read with with Zizek impersonation. Zizek's accent. It's the best word. Politics appears to be over. Wait, Pedro, you have to scratch your nose when you say that voice. So, anyways. In today's world, politics appears to be over, at least as we used to know it. Liberalism persistently fought against its political enemies which had offered alternative systems, that is, conservatism, monarchism, traditionalism, fascism, socialism, and communism, and finally by the end of the 20th century had defeated them all. It would be logical to assume that politics would become liberal while all of its marginalized opponents surviving in the peripheral fringes of global society would reconsider their strategies and formulate new a new united front according to Alain de Benoit's periphery against the center. But instead of the beginning of the 21st century, everything followed a different script. Liberalism, which had always insisted on the minimization of the political, made the decision to abolish politics completely after its triumph. Maybe this was to prevent the formation of political alternatives and make its rule eternal, or because the political agenda had simply expired with the absence of ideological rivals, the presence of which Carl Schmitt had considered indispensable for the proper construction of a political position. Regardless of the rationale, liberalism did everything possible to ensure the collapse of politics. At the same time, liberalism itself has changed, passing from level from the level of ideas, political programs, and decorations, to the level of things, penetrating the very flesh of social reality, which became liberal. This was presented not as a political process, but as a natural and organic one. As a consequence of such a turn of history, all other political ideologies, passionately feuding against each other during the last century, lost their currency. Conservatism, fascism, and communism, together with their secondary variations, lost the battle and triumphant liberalism mutated into a lifestyle. Consumerism, individualism, and a postmodern iteration of fragmented and sub-political being. Politics became biopolitical, moving to the individual and sub-individual level. It turns out that it was not only the defeated political ideologies that left the stage, but politics as such, including liberalism, also exited. It is for that reason that the formation of an alternative became so difficult. Those who do not agree with liberalism find themselves in a difficult situation. The triumphant enemy has dissolved and disappeared. They are struggling against the air. How can one then engage in politics if there is no politics? <coughs> There's only one way out. To reject the classical political theories, both winners and losers, strain the imagination, seize the reality of a new of new uh, the reality of the new global world, correctly decipher the challenges of postmodernity, and to create something new, something beyond the political battles of the 19th and 20th centuries. Such an approach is an invitation to the development of the fourth political theory, beyond communism, fascism, and liberalism. To move forward towards the development of this fourth political theory, it is necessary to reconsider the political history of the last centuries from new positions beyond the frameworks and cliches of the old ideologies. 
realize and become aware of the profound structure of the global society emerging before our eyes, correctly decipher the paradigm of post-modernity, learn to oppose not the political idea, program, or strategy, but the objective status quo, the most social aspect of the apolitical fractured post-society. Finally, construct an autonomous political model which offers a way and a project in the world of deadlocks, <coughs> blind alleys, the endless recycling of the same old things, post-history, according to Baudrillard. This book is dedicated to this very problem as the beginning of the development of a fourth political theory through an overview and a re-examination of the first three political theories and to the closely related ideologies of national Bolshevism and Eurasianism that came very close indeed to the fourth political theory. This is not dogma, not a complete system, not a finished project. This is an invitation to political creativity, a statement of intuitions and conjectures and analysis of new conditions and an attempt at reconsideration of the past. The fourth political theory doesn't appear to us as the work of a single author, but as a trend of a wide spectrum of ideas, researches, analyses, prognoses, and projects. Anyone thinking in this vein can contribute some of his own ideas. Notwithstanding, more and more intellectuals, philosophers, historians, scientists, scholars, and thinkers will respond to this call. It is significant that the book, Against Liberalism, by the successful French intellectual Alain, Alain de Benoit, which is also published in Russian by the publisher Amphora, has a subtitle towards the fourth political theory. Undoubtedly, many things can be said on this theme by representatives of both the old left and the old right, and probably even by liberals themselves, who are conceptualizing qualitative changes of their own political platform where politics is disappearing from. <clears throat> For my own country, Russia, the fourth political theory, among other things, has an immense practical significance. The majority of Russian people suffer their integration into global society as a loss of their own identity. The Russian population had almost entirely rejected liberal ideology in the 1990s. But it is also apparent that a return to the illiberal political ideologies of the 20th century, such as communism or fascism, is unlikely as these ideologies have already failed and historically proven themselves to be incapable of opposing liberalism, to say nothing of the moral costs of totalitarianism. Therefore, in order to fill this political and ideological vacuum, Russia needs a new political idea. For Russia, liberalism does not fit, but communism and fascism are equally unacceptable. Consequently, we need a fourth political theory. And if for someone this is a question of freedom of choice, the realization of political will, which always can be directed both to an assertion and its negation, then for Russia, this is a matter of life and death, Hamlet's eternal question. If Russia, cho eh? if Russia chooses to be then it automatically signifies the creation of a fourth political theory. Otherwise, for Russia, there remains only the choice not to be, then quietly to leave the historical and world stage and dissolve into the global world neither created nor governed by us. <coughs> so far, so good. I don't know, man. Uh, as an American, I must say this uh, is an affront to my Americanness, implying that there's a uh, anything that should matter about Russia. You know, it's it's not America. <coughs> I mean, man, so far so good. Maps. I mean, I, I like that he emphasizes the anti-political nature of liberalism. I Which I agree to be one of the problems with it. So what what question mean, for you? What what does he mean by politics there? That is a good question too, actually. Because I, I mean, mm. yeah, you were gonna say something, Dark Master. Oh, I was just gonna make a, a shitty joke about how they're being America, and then you know, not America geographically. <laughs> uh, it's a complete tangent, but uh, who was it? Uh, oh, Rudolf Steiner uh, said that uh, Russia would uh, be the future of the world mm -hmm. in the next uh, evolutionary stage of mankind. Yep. Not sure about that, but I, I'm not right in complete doubt. Uh, it doesn't look like it. Well, that's because we're barely getting into the... We're barely getting... What is it, Aquarius <laughs> that we're getting into? 
Yeah, we're just barely in the Yeah, corner. and uh, I was actually watching a video in which they're like, you know, um, uh, considering the change of global climate, uh, within the, the next 200 years, like Russia is the most well ge- positioned with regards to geography to take over world empire because as they're so far north, everywhere else is going to become you know desertified due to the increase in temperatures. But Russia will just become nice and temperate. And so it, will, it yeah. has a shit ton of land, shit ton of resources. So if anybody can make it work for them, it would be Russia. All they have to do is hold out. All they have to do is hold out. <clears throat> so, uh, chapter two. Uh, no, and then also, what was I going to say? Uh, yeah, to add to that, um, it also would make sense uh, because Russia is really this this uh, nexus that is a linkage between the East and the West in a way in which uh, they can integrate uh, the lessons of both on a spiritual level as well as a material level. Because uh, while China is getting uh, going with uh, their own shiny moment in the world stage, uh, it's not quite clear that the culture they'll be able to overcome the cultural issues which they lack. Yeah, there's stuff in the West that uh, they sorely need, but they uh, they're very sketchy on getting it because it would uh, undermine uh, the control which the state has. <coughs> Individuality still problem for them. But anyways, let's keep going. Chapter two, concept inception: the end of the twentieth century, the end of modernity. Twentieth century has ended. But it is, it is only now that we are truly beginning to realize and to understand this fact. The 20th century was THE century of ideology. If in the previous centuries religion, uh, dynasties, states, classes, and nation-states played an enormous role in the lives of peoples and societies, then in the 20th century politics has shifted into a purely ideological realm, having redrawn the map of the world ethnicities and civilizations in a new way. On the one hand, political ideologies represented early and deeply rooted civilizational tendencies. On the other hand, they were completely innovative. All political ideologies, having reached the peak of their distribution and influence in the 20th century, were the product of the new modern era, embodying the spirit of modernity, albeit in different ways and even through different symbols. Today we are rapidly leaving this era. Thus everyone speaks more and more often of the crisis of ideology, or even the end of ideology in this fashion. The existence of a state ideology is explicitly denied in the constitution of the Russian Federation. <clears throat> it is past time to address this issue more closely. The three main ideologies and their fate in the 20th century. The three main ideologies of the 20th century were liberalism, communism, and fascism. They fought among themselves to the death, forming in essence the entire dramatic and bloody political history of the 20th century. It is logical to number these ideologies, political theories, both based on their significance and in the order of their occurrence as was done above. The first political theory is liberalism. It arose first as early as the 18th century and turned out to be the most stable and successful ideology, having ultimately prevailed over its rivals in this historic battle. As a result of this victory, it proved, among other factors, the justification of its claim to the entire legacy of the Enlightenment. Today, it is obvious that it was liberalism that was the best fit for modernity. However, this legacy was disputed earlier, dramatically, actively, and at times convincingly, by another political theory, communism. It is reasonable to call communism, much like socialism in all its varieties, the second political theory. It appeared later than liberalism as a critical response to the emergence of the bourgeois capitalist system, which was the ideological expression of liberalism. And finally, fascism is the third political theory. As a contender for its own understanding of, <coughs> sorry, 
As a contender for its own understanding of modernity's spirit, many researchers, Hannah Arendt in particular, reasonably consider totalitarianism one of the political forms of modernity. Fascism, however, turned toward the ideas and symbols of traditional society. In some cases, this gave rise to eclecticism, in others, to the desire of conservatives to lead a revolution instead of resisting it and leading their society in the opposite direction. That is, Arthur Muller, Van den Broek, Dmitry Merez, Merezkovsky, etc. Fascism emerged later than the, ma than the other major political theories and vanished before them. The alliance of the first political theory with the second political theory, as well as Hitler's suicidal geopolitical miscalculations, knocked it down mid-flight. The third political theory was a victim of homicide, or perhaps suicide, not living long enough to see old age and natural decay in contrast to the USSR. Therefore, this bloody vampiric ghost tinged with an aura of global evil is attractive to the decadent taste of postmodernity, still frightening humanity to a great extent. With its disappearance, fascism cleared space for the battle between the first and second political theories. This battle took on the form of the Cold War and gave birth to the strategic geometry of the bipolar world, which lasted for nearly half a century. By 1991, the first political theory, liberalism, had defeated the second political theory, socialism. This marked the global decline of communism. As a result, by the end of the 20th century, liberal theory is the only remaining one of the three political theories of modernity that is capable of mobilizing the vast masses throughout the entire world. Yet, now that it is left on its own, everyone speaks in unison about the end of ideology. Why? <coughs> The End of Liberalism and the Arrival of Post-Liberalism It turns out that the triumph of liberalism, the first political theory, coincided with its end. This only seems to be a paradox. Liberalism had been an ideology from the start. It was not as dogmatic as Marxism, but was no less philosophical, graceful, and refined. It ideologically opposed Marxism and fascism, not only undertaking a technological war for survival, but also defending its right to monopolize its own image of the future. While the other competing ideologies were alive, liberalism continued on and grew stronger precisely as an ideology, that is, a set of ideas, views, and projects that are typically that are typical for a historical subject. Each of the three political theories had its own subject. The subject of communism was class. Fascism's subject was the state in Italian fascism under Mussolini, or race in Hitler's National Socialism. In liberalism, the subject was represented by the individual. Freed from all other, freed from all forms of collective identity and any membership. While the ideological struggle had formal opponents, entire nations and societies, at least theoretically, were able to select their subject of choice: that of class, racism, statism, or individualism. The victory of liberalism resolved this question. The individual became the normative subject within the framework of all mankind. It is at this point that the phenomenon of globalization arises. The model of a post-industrial society makes itself known, and the post-modern era begins. From now on, the individual subject is no longer the result of choice, but is a kind of a mandatory given. Man is freed from his membership in collective identities, and the ideology of human rights becomes widely accepted, at least in theory, and is practically compulsory. A humanity under liberalism comprised of individuals is naturally drawn toward universality and seeks to become global and unified. Thus the projects of the world state, global governance, and the world government or globalism are born. A new level of technological development makes it possible to achieve independence from the class structuralization of industrial societies, that is, post-industrialism. The values of rationalism, scientism, and positivism are recognized as veiled forms of repressive totalitarian policies or the grand narrative and are criticized. At the same time, this is accompanied by a parallel, parallel, eh, parallel, oh my god, my tongue getting tight. At the same time, this is accompanied. <laughs> Yeah. At the same time, this is accompanied by parallel glorification of complete freedom and independence of the individual from any kind of limiting factors, including reason, morality, identity, 
social, ethnic, and even gendered, disciplines, etc. This is the condition of post-modernity. At this stage, liberalism ceases to be the first political theory and becomes the only post-political practice. Fukuyama's end of history arrives, economics in the form of the global capitalist market replaces politics, and states and nations are dissolved in the melting pot of world globalization. <clears throat> Having triumphed, liberalism disappears and turns into a different entity, into post-liberalism. It no longer has political dimensions. It does not present, represent free choice, but instead becomes a kind of historically deterministic destiny. This is the source of the thesis about the post-industrial society, economics as destiny. Thus, the beginning of the 21st century coincides with the end of ideology, that is, all three of them. Each met a different end. The third political theory was destroyed in its youth. The second died of decrepit old age, and the first was reborn as something else. A post, as post-liberalism and the global market society. In any case, the form which all three political theories took on in the 20th century is no longer useful, if lack, effective, or relevant. They lack explanatory uh, power, the ability to help us understand current events, and the capability to respond to global challenges. The need for the fourth political theory stems from this assessment. Uh, just <laughs> I suppose something to, to be said is that uh, uh, it should seem strange that uh, an ideology which is so focused on individualism like radically abstract individualism would also lead to the most radically abstract universalism uh, just because then they like when your life is itself abstract the the way that you see the world is itself in the uh, the inverted sense of universal abstractions So anyways, continue. The fourth political theory as resistance to the status quo. The fourth political theory will not be just handed to us without any effort. It may or may not emerge. The prerequisite for its appearance is dissent. That is, dissent against post-liberalism as a universal practice, against globalization, against post-modernity, against the end of history, against the status quo, against the inertial development of major civilizational processes at the dawn of the 21st century. The status quo and this inertia do not presuppose any political theories whatsoever. A global world can only be ruled by the laws of economics and the universal morality of human rights. All political decisions are replaced by technical ones. Machinery and technology substitute for all else. The French philosopher Alain de Benoit terms this la gouvernance or micromanagement. Managers and technocrats take the place of the politician who makes historical decisions, optimizing the logistics of management. Masses of people are equated to the single mass of individual objects. For this reason, post-liberal reality, or rather virtuality increasingly displacing reality from itself, leads straight to the complete abolition of politics. Some may argue that the liberals lie to us when they speak of the end of ideology. This was my debate with philosopher Alexander Sinoviev. In reality, they remain believers in their ideology and simply deny all others the right to exist. This is not exactly true. When liberalism transforms from being an ideological arrangement to the only content of extant social and technological existence, then it is no longer an ideology but an existential fact, an objective order of things, the challenge of which is not only difficult, but also foolish. In the postmodern era, liberalism moves from the sphere of the subject to the sphere of the object. This will potentially lead to the complete replacement of reality by virtuality. The fourth political theory is conceived as an alternative to post-liberalism but not as one ideological arrangement in relation to another. Instead, it is an incorporeal idea opposed to corporeal matter, as a possibility entering into conflict with the actuality as that which is yet to come into being attacking that which is already in existence. 
At the same time, the fourth political theory cannot be con the continuation of either the second political theory or the third. The end of fascism, much like the end of communism, was not just an accidental misunderstanding, but the expression of rather lucid historical logic. They challenged the spirit of modernity. Fascism did so almost openly, communism more covertly. See the reviews of the Soviet period as a special eschatological version of the traditional society by Mikhail S. Agursky or Sergei Karamurza and Lost. This means that the struggle with postmodern metamorphosis of liberalism in the form of postmodernity and globalization should be qualitatively different. It must be based on new principles and propose new strategies. Nevertheless, the starting point of this ideology is precisely the rejection of the very essence of postmodernity. This starting point is possible, but neither guaranteed nor fatal nor predetermined because it arises from man's free will, from his spirit rather than, impersonal, than an impersonal historic process. However, this essence, much like the detection of the rationale behind modernity itself, imperceptible earlier, which realized its essence so fully that it exhausted its internal resources and switched to the mode of ironic recycling of its earlier stages, is something completely new, previously unknown and only surmised intuitively and fragmentarily during the earlier stages of ideological history and the ideological struggle. The fourth political theory is a crusade against. If the third, <coughs> if the third political theory criticizes capitalism from the right and the second from the left, then the new stage no longer features this political topography. It is impossible to determine where the right and the left are located in relation to post-liberalism. There are only two positions, compliance, the center, and dissent, the periphery. Both positions are global. <coughs> Hmm. I don't Before. know if that's true. I think the problem with, with these debates is that you can't define terms and concepts <clears throat> to whatever you want, you know? Yeah. You can simply, like, take out of your ass a certain definition of left and right and then use this word according to this implicit definition and say, well, uh, the fourth political theory cannot be uh, understood in terms of left and right, right? Actually, Even the no. concept of modernity itself that it's been operative in this, in this text is contingent, right? You can define modernity in whatever terms you like and then condemn it or enjoy it in whatever values, through whatever values you came up with so, at that point, you know. So, it's, it's, yeah. it's pretty arbitrary, but it's interesting, but... Yeah, so I just want to say, I just want to say that the way it's using terms, uh, I'm, not, I'm not convinced it's consistent with the historical contingency of those terms. Uh... Well, no, I mean, I, so far, what he's talking about seems to be very much in the usual way we, we use these terms, so it's it's nothing new. Uh, it's not it's not every ordinary. Uh, what Pedro uh, said, though, is true in that uh, uh, what he's talking about it is just a certain given set of conceptions, whether he whether it is the just popularly given understanding or whether it's his own given understanding. Uh, either way... Uh, these can mean whatever the hell one wants uh, uh, in the usual way that people operate with these terms anyways uh, in order to get a, a objective so to say uh, conception of things that uh, you would have to have a very maybe, deep yeah. systematic understanding <laughs> yeah I guess maybe I'm thinking about the usages of these terms within you know the respective domain of political theory and not so much within common parlance Either way, what you see many times is people come up with certain definitions, right? And they give a nominal representative to that definition. And they use that definition as to 
conceptualize certain supposedly pre-definitional entities, right? Yeah, they sort uh, of... The problem is that you can define things whatever you want, but if you are not willing to justify your definition or to show how that definition has a reason which is opposed and superior against other definitions, your concept is worthless, philosophically speaking. And your debate will be worthless too. Uh, I've seen the debate between Duggan and Levy, and I could simply ask Duggan at that point, uh, what is the justification of your particular concept of modernity and why it should be preferred uh, over and against other conceptions, you know? Because when Levy was talking about modernity, he was talking about, well, uh, dialogue, uh, f f uh, freedom. He was talking about the possibility of people engaging in, in, in mutual um, decisions, etc., etc., etc. And when Duggan was speaking about uh, modernity, he was speaking about oppressive expansion of the Western set of values over and against any other values uh, uh, available or existent in other parts of the world. So what is modernity, normatively speaking? Because you can simply look at something. The, the example of family is very good. When you are going to do a research about family, right, a empirical research about family, you need to begin with a certain conception of family. Otherwise, you won't be able to see family. You won't be able to grasp family in the empirical reality. But what gives you the authority to prefer that, that, that particular definition of, of family among others which are available? You know what I mean? And that's a, the same problem here. So I think they're, they're like dancing with con concepts and in 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 the in, in the end it's all about trying to defend a certain intuitive moral and political tendency with available concepts it's not science it's i have this particular feeling against western society so i'm going to read and study to find out some conceptions which could be used to articulate in a apparently rational manner this uh, inner tendency you know which is something pretty very much liberal <laughs> <clears throat> mm, yeah losing using the structures of liberalism uh, against itself but, but yeah. just one more commentary what I find interesting is that Duggan is something is doing something here that usually uh, left-wing intellectuals don't he really goes through the bi 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 biography without preconceptions. I mean, he reads Marx, he reads like Baudrillard, he reads all those uh, like left-wing uh, luminaires, you know, while left-wing people usually they, they don't read those guys, right? They don't go about reading Rothbard, you know? They have this caricature in their minds and they attack them and that's it. There is no engagement with the with a opposite field. Yeah, I mean, uh, well, uh, the re the reality is uh, that that's just the case for both the right and the left. Generally, uh, you know, the the laity will never read the other side, uh, and even the people who are the intellectuals of the the sides uh, will rarely ever really read the other side. So it's very rare that you have people who will actually engage um, with good faith uh, the other side and, you know, admit that, oh, well, you know, here they have a good point, but, you know, it's just, it's incomplete, it's a misunderstanding, blah, 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 but uh, that's a very rare thing. Uh <clears throat> the fourth political theory is the amalgamation of a common project and an in and in an a common impulse to everything that was discarded, toppled, and humiliated during the course of constructing the society of the spectacle, constructing post-modernity. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Mark 12.10 The philosopher Alexander Sikatsky 
rightly pointed out the, the significance of marginalia and the formation of a new philosophical eon, suggesting the term metaphysics of debris as a metaphor. <laughs> For example, uh, that's six right. <laughs> This rhetoric over here about periphery is very common in left-wing post-colonial theory, you know? Like, I feel like post-colonial theory in its critique uh, uh, of, of liberalism and modernity is very, very much closed to Dougie, in a sense. And I, I, don't, I, I don't really see the difference between them in their ascension standpoints, you know? This this attachment to a certain civilizational identity that that would be ruined by the dissolution that liberalism operates in traditional societies, you know? This critique of modernity as setting forth particular values as if they were universal, etc., etc., etc. So I find it funny because, like, post-colonial theory... Uh, usually it, 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 it is like a, a certain fourth political theory, but from the left. And content-wise, it's very similar to Dugging, but their lifestyles are different. You know what I mean? Like, like I think Dugging is only a post-colonialist who doesn't go to Starbucks, you know what I mean? It's something like that. <laughs> Well, yeah, I could I could see that. I mean, uh, as as far as I remember, like uh, I watched the same debate I mean, you mentioned of uh, Dugan versus uh, the French guy, um, Andre Levy. Levine. Levine. Yeah. Yeah, like like Levy. all 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 that Dugan does is he's like, okay, well, you guys claim to be one to be against oppression, and two that you're for difference, and he's like, okay, then so are we, and the point is then leave us the fuck alone. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. The the idea that that uh, the Western metaphysical foundations are not able to take the take otherness seriously uh, is is a recurrent uh, rhetorical pinpoint of of, of Dugging, which also appears in what Derrida in Levina, right? So I thought it was so funny when Dugging said that. Um, Liberal, liberal, liberalism was uh, the the ideology of the same, like which is which is which is a very very interesting paraphrase from Levinas' accusation against ontology as being uh, the metaphysics of the same, right? Of being unable to think difference uh, in positive terms. Uh, yeah, definitely, and. Uh... I think it's a very smart move, uh, since yeah. you know, it's, it's uh, what's dominating right now as far as uh, the general understanding. I've, I've, of, I've been foreseeing theory. this this move, like since I I started to understand the the, the blind spots of a of, of a certain critique of modernity, like and he's simply doing it. Um, yeah, that that last paragraph though so, uh, kind of made me chuckle because. Uh, that's the one. The Society of the Spectacle. That's from uh, what is it? Uh, the flat French guy's work. Uh, the board. The board. The and and then Maggie. like uh, the marginalia, metaphysics of debris. That reminds me of uh, uh, Walter Benjamin. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Like to tr to to. He has that phrase uh, <laughs> about history, right? Yeah, the debris of history. Yeah. So it's part of his theory of the dialectical image, uh, part of the project of the arcades. Uh, which uh, I love, by the way. I love when people do this because it, it's just kind of, <laughs> it's very interesting. You know, like they, they're completely inverting shit. Like they're like, oh, you know, you call me right wing, but uh, let me quote Marx at you and uh, let me quote all these other leftist people. And uh, I agree with them to, you know, to a certain extent. You know, I'm not afraid yeah. to say it. Yeah. It's uh, partly why I, I find people. Uh, <coughs> there's this other guy who uh, I find interesting. Uh, I appear and I find him interesting. What's his name? Uh, uh, Jason Reza Giorgiani. Also, it's like the right wing kind of guy who, who's kind of like, yeah, one would say a fourth political theory kind of dude. He doesn't really care about politics as such, but uh, like he's mostly known on the right wing circles, alt right particularly. And uh, he'll quote 
leftist at you. He'll quote Marx and praise Marx and the USSR and all this other stuff. <laughs> but he's totally not a not a leftist in the usual any usual yeah. sense. That goes to show <laughs> the, fo- the 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 complete formality of these theories in certain spots, right? The blind spots of formality, and also the the um, not so not so desired consequences of certain premises which are not explored right which are simply put to the side okay so if there is no way of determining uh, a qualitative difference a value difference between any set of creeds civilizational creeds so leave us alone <laughs> so why you are better than us so let us beat our wives shit right <laughs> Like beating my wife is a is a old no my millennial custom here in Russia, you know. Well, I don't I don't know what the traditional marriages in Russia are like. Uh, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Just very for the record. traditional. <laughs> but it, it is very traditional, and they are not <laughs> up much up to this idea of this diffusion of of gender and stuff like that. Because that's the point. You can, when you when you make a, this critique of foundationalism, when you make a critique of 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 reason in its formal sense, in which reason is not able anymore to derive any content from itself, so all it can do is to is to 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 account for the coherence of certain formal systems. When you do that, you can take two ways. Either you can be, let's say, the creative, I will call it, and you can simply start to play with concepts and values and simply multiply them to the infinity, as we can see, for example, in the, the idea of, of queerness in, in, in queer theory. Uh, or you can simply say, this is a fucking chaos. I don't want that, so I'm going to look for the roots of my civilizational source and I'm going to... Uh, grab that as a certain point of security within the chaos of this uh, infinite multiplication of meaning and values, right? So, and there is nothing to decide which one of those poles are the, 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 are the, the, the right pole to depart from, right? There is no way. It's, it reminds me of Shaolin saying, hey guys, I'm sorry, but there is philosophy of nature and transcendental philosophy and there is no way to, to, to determine which one is the correct one right yeah except Schelling said uh, let's just do both <laughs> yeah yeah but in this case it's not possible right <laughs> either <laughs> you are queer Maybe. and you are destroying every concept whatsoever showing how this, these concepts are contingent how they do not have any reason whatsoever to be realized against other concepts and let's just simply create stuff out of my fucking ass. Or we can simply, I think it's a difference of temperament. More, 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 more conservative temperaments seeing how reason emptied of any content cannot account, account for the truth of any content whatsoever these guys are going to try to simply grab the, the next civilizational uh, content uh, custom that they have in front of them and try and, and going to try to, to, to realize a state based on that, right? Which is like postmodern conservatism. Like, I know that there is no reason founding my choices, but at least I have content. Or you can go the formalist side and say, fuck this shit, I'm going to do whatever I want. I am this empty individual which uh, have to, I don't have to, to, to compromise with, with any content whatsoever, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, yeah, I think that the way they see it, you know, people like Dugan and uh, the general uh, political theory community sees it as, uh, yeah, it's either one or the other. Uh, I think, you know, obviously from a, a Hegelian standpoint, with when you have a grasp of how logic can work and what it can do, 
what it allows you to comprehend, uh, it seems to me uh, very feasible that you can have both. Uh, you can you can retrieve that in tradition which is worth maintaining, yes. and therefore you know giving you historical grounding while also being capable of freeing yourself from all the garbage that is tradition. Yeah. Yeah, 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 definitely. But but these guys, they're they're <laughs> they're not very knowledgeable in, in Hegelian philosophy, right? Yeah. I it, like yep. that's why <clears throat> that's why I came to Hegel. Actually, those were the kinds of questions that actually led me to 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 really appreciate what Hegel was doing, right? And to understand it, but because those questions were mine questions once upon a time. Yeah, it's interesting. So, anyways, continuing, the battle for the battle for post-modernity. <clears throat> the fourth political theory deals with the new reincarnation of an old enemy. It challenges liberalism, much like the second and third political theories of the past, but it does so under new conditions. The principal novelty of these conditions lies in the fact that of all the three great political ideologies. Only liberalism secured the right to own the legacy behind the spirit of modernity and obtain the right to create the end of history based on its own premises. Theoretically, the end of history could have been different. A planetary Reich, if the Nazis had won, or a global communism had the communists been right. However, the end of history has turned out to be precisely liberal. The philosopher Alexander Kozhev was one of the first to predict this. His ideas were later reproduced by Francis Fukuyama. But since this is the case, then any appeals to modernity and its assumptions, to which the represented representatives of the second, to a greater extent, and their political theories appealed in varying degrees, lose their relevance. They lost the battle for modernity as the liberals triumphed. For this reason, the issue of modernity and, incidentally, of modernization may be removed from the agenda. Now the battle for post-modernity begins well uh, I think I agree with him here um, in that uh, fascism as it, as it has happened before is not going to happen again uh, and communism as it has happened before will not happen like that again uh, those are dead movements like th they have nowhere else to go <coughs> Nonetheless, uh, there's still live options to a certain extent. Uh, there, there are, there's a clear fascist tendency that uh, it's hard to miss. You know that that has happened after the, the post two thousand eight like economic crash world. Uh, anybody yeah. who pretends that this isn't the case is just not looking at the world. Naive, blind. Uh, now, as far as communism, uh, obviously there, there's there's still you know there's still these little pockets of left resurgences of attempts. Uh, so far, there's not been no there's been no success, uh, mainly because uh, due to the way the the operation of of what is required for communism functions, uh, you just you can't do it in a, in a capitalist system at all. Uh, you know, you can you can have these little pockets of resistance of like uh, pink tides, in which you have these moments of pushes for, you know, more social democracy. But uh, uh, nobody is going to try for a, a you know another Marxist-Leninist state, for example. It's just not going to happen. Um, yeah, but but his silence <laughs> silence on on China is symptomatic, right? I wonder how China would fit within his. Framework. Um, they definitely. I, I I I think he would say that China is doing exactly what he wants Russia to do, uh, in which like they're not. They're they're not falling into the global hegemonic system. Uh, you know they're in it, but they're not falling into it. As a matter of fact, they're they're carving out their own little sphere, and like, it's it's literally you know it's what's what the Chinese call it. You know the Chi you know, socialism with Chinese characteristics. Uh, and what Dugan would want, want uh, as far as I understand, what he wants Russia to do is basically just that, you know, like maybe capitalism with Russian characteristics, or maybe socialism with Russian characteristics. Yeah. <coughs> for example, Kwame Nkrumah, 
the the leader of um, what was the of Ghana's independency. He also he begins as a pure blood Marxist Leninist, and then he understands that that wouldn't work if it was not adapted to to Ghana's African particularities, right? So he also had this idea that there should be a certain respect for the the conventional pool of ideas of a certain country a certain respect <coughs> that liberalism is not able to offer right mm. even though in brazil there is this interesting phenomena of people who say that they are economically liberal and conservative in customs right as if that was possible in the long term right yeah, yeah, that's a uh, that's a pretty. Uh, that's also something that happens in the U.S. So, uh, it's a very small group of people that say that, but uh, it, it does happen. And um, I don't think that it's not possible. Yeah. Uh, I just think that it's. It depends on. It, it's something that people just don't find. Uh, uh, explicable uh, in that this is not a position that's represented in the general self-understanding you don't find this position represented much if at all in academia you definitely don't see it in the media uh, and so you know the people who inhabit it which uh, in the US as far as I understand it it is a significant number of people um, in which like they have conservative values uh, socially but economically you know they're they're very they're they're left you know they're pro-union they're pro-universal health care they're pro you know free college for everybody uh, all these things uh, it's just you know uh, they're still like monogamous wasps uh, of some sort I don't think they're wasps that much but uh, they're kind of a more way more conservative yeah, way more conservative than than liberals are. Um, so it does happen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <coughs> yeah. When when you meet old communists here in Portugal, you you really feel that you know you really feel like the like the youngsters think that oh I'm going to find that old progressive man and stuff like nope. <laughs> he has very similar opinions to a conservative in certain in certain instances. Primarily the moral one, right? All family should be worked out, etc., etc. Yeah. Which is interesting. Which it shows, like, how these ideas are not being thought in their necessary connections, right? It's all about like putting them in a certain pot and mixing them and see what how how it goes, right? But maybe, just maybe, liberal economy actually leads. To the empty uh, emptiness of, of of conventional values, to emptying, I mean, the conventional. Maybe that's the case, you know. Maybe moral yeah, values just, they yeah. they actually lead to certain. Uh, I just certain... want to. Sorry, I just want to say fast that um, Australia is a great example with its Catholic Catholic influence, where like socially it can be very traditionalist in some sectors. And historically, it's been, but then economically, it's been quite progressive. See? Uh, yeah. Okay, well, what, what were you saying, Pedro? You were getting somewhere interesting. Uh, I said that maybe, like, when you have a, a certain universalized, I mean, within a certain community, a certain universalized set of customs, maybe that will lead to a more controlled, non-liberal economy. You, you know what I mean? So that goes to show that how, how, how these guys are not thinking the necessary connections between ideas, at least from my standpoint here. Yeah, I, I can see it. Uh, it would depend on like what one means about uh, liberal economies um, in the sense that, uh, <coughs> like, uh, for example, like, well, or, like, are you talking about how... Uh, you may have a, a culture in which uh, certain things, like say for example Spain, uh, like old, uh, not Spain right now, but uh, Spain, you know, say like uh, 50 years ago, 
uh, in which like, you have the culture of the siesta and, uh, <laughs> you know, the afternoon tea or like nap or whatever. Uh, you know, yeah. a, a capital market economy that's, you know, liberalized, you know, it's just like maximum profit or full steam. Uh, it can't allow for something like that. But if you have a culture where yeah. that's that's a pretty deep cultural value, you're like, uh, fuck that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but l- let me give you like an example of of of, the, of this connection. I would I would say that a liberal economy is one which is it's which is detached from any familiar or or political or conventional uh, uh, demand, right? So you are not selling your grain to debt man because he has a long standing relationship with your with your family you are selling the grain for someone who was buying it like like for someone like who is going to to give you more profit for it right so that necessarily will lead to a like we if we in economic in in a, in an economical system which is detached from any conventional demand, you have the possibility and ac- in actually the realization of the multiplication of needs, right? So you are going to start to try to sell some <laughs> fucked up shit, and these fucked up shit will appeal to certain lifestyles that that are not conventional at all. Take for instance the ano plug. You know what I mean? This is a good yeah, example. Yeah. Anal plugs. <laughs> like, in the moment that you try to sell anal plugs, you are actually saying it is cool to put things up to your ass. <laughs> you see? That, that's a yeah, fact. Yeah. So I think that an, an, an economy which is detached from any conventional demand will lead to the multiplication of, of desire uh, out of the bounds of conventional desire. That I think that's one one good necessary connection over there you know okay okay yeah okay i know i know what you're talking about then yeah yeah it certainly makes sense uh and i mean like uh to, to that extent uh realistically speaking uh no no state uh for example can ever really be truly fully li- liberal without just destroying itself as a state completely um, you know because then you couldn't have a justification for tariffs you couldn't have anything like punishments for corporations for doing things against the state it's the state's interests you know corporations you know because the reality is uh, everyone understands that corporations have no national <laughs> uh, uh, patriotism whatsoever they don't give a fuck uh, you know if Halliburton could to. Yeah, if Halliburton could get away with like you know making more profit by moving to Russia, they would. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they have such a technology that they can simply move, right? There is no natural limit to the <coughs> mobility of capital, so there is no national bounds to it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but uh, I, we can't like speak of a fully liberal state, of course, because like you said, it would just collapse in on itself. I guess it's more of just a comparison in that, like, what we're living in right now is as liberal as it gets, probably. Yeah, I think the U.S. is the the paradigm of uh, the extreme of liberalism, uh, whereas China yeah, is yeah. Uh, China is definitely not liberal. Uh, in China, uh, prof- profit is not an argument for you being able allowed to do certain things. Uh, like for example the, the also... uh, sorry sorry Anthony. Uh, yeah so for example the last year uh what is it who's is the guy who uh founded alibaba jack ma uh, jack ma yeah yeah uh so last year jack ma got in trouble because uh he opened his big mouth and uh shit talked the government saying that they were idiots because uh they were slowing down his attempt at you know uh deregulated um uh, decentralized finance and the government uh, basically t- gave him a big fuck you, uh, not only because he shit taught, but because the reason he shit taught was that he was complaining that the you know they were that the Chinese government was uh, not taking the opportunities and allowing people to uh, uh, you know innovate and create these new avenues of profits. And obviously, the Chinese government's like, we don't give a fuck about your profits. We give a fuck about you know, are you gonna like fuck up our economy? Are you gonna create some systematic risks which we uh, won't be in control of? And they're like, uh, 
we don't care if you make $10 billion or, you know, more, uh, if, you know, that's going to lead to systematic risks that, you know, like the U.S. does. Uh, it doesn't matter to us. You know, we, we can't allow that, and so they don't. Yeah. So, yeah, to, to that extent, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we can resume. Okay. I, I... <clears throat> so, continuing... And it is here that, that new prospects open up for the fourth political theory, that kind of postmodernity which is currently being realized in practice post-liberal postmodernity cancels out the strict logic of modernity itself. After the goal had been achieved, the steps toward reaching it lose their meaning. The pressure of the ideological shell becomes less rigid. The dictatorship of ideas is replaced by the dictatorship of things. Login passwords and barcodes, new holes are appearing in the fabric of postmodern reality. As the third and second political theory is conceived as an eschatological version of traditionalism once tried to saddle modernity in their struggle with liberalism, the first political theory, today there is a chance of accomplishing something analogous with postmodernity, using these new holes in particular. Liberalism developed flawlessly operating weapons aimed at its straightforward alternatives, which was the basis for its victory. But it is this very victory that holds the great the greatest risk to liberalism. We must only ascertain the location of these new vulnerable spots in the global system and decipher its login passwords in order to hack into that system. At the very least, we must try to do so. The events of 9-11 in New York demonstrate that this is possible even technologically. The Internet Society can be useful even to its staunch opponents. In any case, first and foremost, we must understand postmodernity and the new situation no less profoundly than Marx understood the structure of industrial capitalism. Just got to say that uh, if not 100 years down the line, at least anywhere after that, 9-11 will be seen as a world historical moment of just like massive importance. Absolutely. <clears throat> like uh, the actuality of what 9-11, you know, the, the collapse of the towers is like really nothing. Uh, in comparison to just what this occasioned as a political pivot point, uh, yeah, not not just in, like yeah. in explicit politics, but in the implicit material politics of not just the U.S. but really every other state, uh, yep. everywhere the else. Birth of global fascism. What what I find interesting in nine eleven, of course, like the the event itself. As you said, is not as important as the implicit political content, but it it wasn't it was a, it, it was an event that had the face of American movies, man. Like it was not about bombs; it was about two huge, the hugest. Uh, it was a Texan <laughs> event because with the hugest airplanes against the hugest. Uh, buildings in the world, you know, and that explosion, it looked like a Vin Diesel movie, man. I mean, Vin Diesel uh, w w would be considered a child compared to that, right? Technically, <laughs> it was very American, you know? Like, you could put America, fuck yeah, and behind and, and, and feel American looking at that. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, it definitely was a show. Those guys yeah, I, watched I mean, a I, lot I of American movies. Like, I think it's the spectacle of it is why it's become like such a political pivot point because I don't know, we can point to so many things that have happened over the last few years that have killed far more people than nine eleven ever has. But it wasn't in an instant, it wasn't in such a spectacular fashion in which yeah. it was able to captivate everyone. Yeah, but for it, like it, a but, political move to, for leaders to take advantage of. Yeah, but it was not French spectacular. It wasn't Russian spectacular. It was particularly American spectacular. That idea could have only came out of the head of someone who had watched some block American action movie blockbuster. You know what I mean? Like two airplanes, man shocking against the the, the biggest 
buildings ever made by humankind, you know? Yep. Are you saying those Pakistanis didn't do it? I'm just saying no planes hit no. Building 7. I'm saying that those guys watched it. American <laughs> porn. They watched it. American movies. They enjoyed it. Have you ever heard what they found in Osama Bin Laden room? He, he was playing Pokemon? American video, video games, man. He was playing. He was watching American porn, you know? That was a CIA guy. <laughs> oh, Osama. I mean, he was our president. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think that you mean uh, Hussein. No, I mean Osama bin Laden. No, yeah, that was yeah, just yeah. a joke. <laughs> He's a joke. I, I, I'm not. I, you're talking about Obama. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Obama bin Laden. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's keep going. Uh, the fourth political theory must draw its dark inspiration from postmodernity, from the liquidation of the Enlightenment program, and the arrival of the Society of Simulacra. Interpreting this as an incentive for battle rather than a fatal given. Rethinking the past and those who lost. The second and third political theories are unacceptable as starting points for resisting liberalism, particularly because of the way in which they understood themselves, what they appealed to, and how they, op they operated. They positioned themselves as contenders for the expression of the soul of modernity and failed in that endeavor. Yet nothing stops us from rethinking the very fact of their failure as something positive, their vices recast as virtues. Since the logic of the history of the new era brought us to post-modernity, then it also contained the secret essence of the new era, which was only revealed to us in the end. The second and third political theories recognized themselves as contenders for the expression of modernity's spirit, and these claims came crashing down. Everything related to these unfulfilled intentions and the previous ideologies is of at least interest to the, for the creators of the fourth political theory. However, we should attribute the very fact that they lost to one of their advantages rather than their disadvantages. By losing, they proved that they did not belong to the spirit of modernity, which in turn led to the post-liberal matrix. Herein lie their advantages. Moreover, this means that the representatives of the second and third political theories, either consciously or unconsciously, stood on the side of tradition, however, without drawing the necessary conclusions from this or not recognizing it at all. <clears throat> well, uh, I can see that for fascism to a very loose extent, but uh, no, not communism. Uh, but like, it depends what on um, what you understand by communism, because many communists they they argue that the natural state of humankind was a certain kind of communal communism right and that modern yeah. communism would simply recast in technological terms that natural uh, state oh so it depends yeah, on, on where you draw yeah. where you pinpoint what tradition is right because well shitting on this on the streets is traditional in a sense considering that <laughs> you didn't have bathrooms like, not a long while ago, you know, we had Dude, to shit th this some... is the fucking shit that, like... Okay, I don't want to make names, but so yeah, someone was, like, talking do about the fucking... <coughs> don't do Indus it. Indus River Valley or whatever being social... That's basically what this idea is. <laughs> yeah, I know what you're yeah. talking about. Dumb. <laughs> yeah, like, uh, I have a conservative friend. He is Catholic. He is <clears throat> studying to be a priest, Catholic priest. And he's all about... You know, Pedro, I think uh, the Vatican should not bend to the immediate demands of of, of liberalism uh, and of progressism, you know? Uh, I think we should actualize ourselves. Jesuit. What? What? <laughs> Tell him, fuck off, Jesuit. No, <laughs> and you know what I asked him? I asked him, okay, so you were saying that there are some traditional... Uh, values which should be abandoned, right? And he said, okay, yes. And there are many traditional values that should be retained by the Vatican, right? And, and, and he said, yes. So how do you decide? 
and he couldn't answer me. It's all about, well, like, for example, Duggan. Well, uh, like, what will be Duggan's uh, past Russia? Because Russia has a long history, right? And there were a lot of conventional differences between those, those eras. So what will be, like, the point of departure from which they will draw their values, you know? That will become a question, too. You know, so you will have a fight over what tradition itself means. And you don't have a criteria which tradition itself can, can give you to this selection. So you're creating a whole new set of problems which are very similar to the problems, uh, non-traditional problems in a sense, which is what is your criteria of selection and justification of institutions? If you say, no, let's go for tradition. All right, but what is the content of this tradition? Are you talking about Neanderthal shit? Are you talking about uh, communal prehistorical societies? What are you talking about when you talk about tradition, you know? And this selection itself, like in which you take a certain period of time and use it as a reference of what tradition really means, uh, is itself like a contingent uh, uh, selection. Yeah, yeah. The reason I say like communism doesn't properly fall into tradition is like a, I'm specifically going with like a, the Marxist view and particularly Marx, not people after Marx uh, who call themselves Marxists. Uh, for Marx, you know, Marx is a thoroughly modern figure. Uh, not not fully modern because uh, in the Hegelian sense, in which for Hegel, modernity is just the era of self-determination in which we finally have the means and the possibility for a fully self-cognized, understood reality, which is understood on its own account for itself uh, through the independence of reason. Um, <coughs> and uh, Marx falls way more towards that than uh, towards tradition, in that uh, he at least believes he's working on something like that, uh, even though there's certain ways in which he's not. Uh, nonetheless, he's trying. Yeah. So to that extent, I would say communism doesn't fall into that. Although I think, practically speaking, you're right that uh, it does uh, fall into that. And even and people don't realize it, uh, you know, because like the, the, the desire to... <laughs> the desire to look into the past or look somewhere else for foundation uh, is so strong that people end up doing it without knowing it. You know, people who go like, oh, but primitive communism... And, you know, and this is a real way that we, we would be were it not for the distortion of capitalism and class society. Yeah. Um, yeah, those people are appealing to tradition. Yeah, because, because there is no way out of it. Because you need <coughs> to presuppose a certain uh, 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 anthropological conception, normative anthropological conceptual, to actually reject any institution whatsoever in this case. You know, you need to have a certain understanding of a certain pre-social human being which is flourishing really uh, free from the, the oppression of alienation and exploitation and then you use that as a standard to condemn or to or to justify certain institutions that's the only way you know because you can ask so why not this exploitation why not alienation what human being has that 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 is so that is so special that it should be left out of these uh, 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 social operations. You know, you can ask that. People don't go don't go as far, right? But you can do. Okay, okay. So, like uh, that clarifies something. Uh, yes, in that sense, I would say Marx is definitely. If one classifies it as tradition, Marx is definitely on the side of tradition because uh, that anthropological nature thing. You know, Marx is like complaining about oh human nature. Uh, Marx has a human nature too, you stupid fucks. <laughs> like, it's literally right there. You, the whole thing of alienation, it's nothing but Marx's concept of human nature. And yeah. it is human yeah. nature. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> uh, that, 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 that's my point, yeah. Uh, yeah, <coughs> so uh, continuing. The second and third political theories must be reconsidered, selecting them selecting in them that which must be discarded and that which has value in itself. And there we go. Well, what is the criterion of that? We don't know. He will not say, Let, let's keep an eye <coughs> for it. He will not say it. 
Just like Bl Butler didn't say in, in, in her gender trouble, nothing about it. Why should we deny, like, uh, how can we uh, uh, separate, uh, like, good differences from dis differences that, are, that should be that, that should be rejected, etc., etc. But sorry, please continue. As complete ideologies try to get their own way, literally, they are entirely useless, either theoretically or practically. However, certain marginal elements that were generally not implemented or remain on the periphery or in the shadows, let us recall the metaphysics of debris once again, may unexpectedly turn out to be extremely valuable and saturated with meaning and intuition. Yet in any case, it is necessary to rethink the second and third political theories in a new way, from a new perspective, and only after we reject our trust in those ideological structures on which their orthodoxy rested. Their orthodoxy is their most uninteresting and worthless aspect. Cross-reading them would be far more productive. Marx through a positive view of the right, or Evola through a positive view of the left. This fascinating national Bolshevik undertaking in the spirit of Nikolai V. Ustrelov or Ernest Nikish is not sufficient by itself. After all, a mechanical addition of the second political theory to the third will not by itself lead us anywhere. Only in retrospect can we delineate their common regions which we staunchly opposed to liberalism. This methodological exercise is useful as a warm-up before commencing a full-fledged elaboration of the fourth political theory. A truly significant and decisive reading of the second and third political theories is only possible on the basis of an already established fourth political theory. Postmodernity and its conditions, the globalist world, governance or micromanagement, the market, society, the universalism of human rights, the real domination of capital, etc., represent the main object in the fourth political theory, however they are radically negated as a value. Now, I, I have an assumption of why he's against human rights, but... Uh, yeah, yeah, I was asking, I, I was... I was almost asking about that. What is the problem here? <laughs> uh, I assume that the problem is human rights is used as a uh, a dog whistle, so to say. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Which is used against anyone who's against the hegemony of the U.S. Yeah, yeah. That's 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 true. But I, I also think that there may be something to do with the content of human in this in this human right framework you know like i remember iram yozai free pong saying that medieval con conception of freedom was very different from modern concept of, of freedom and that medieval concept concept of freedom was related to the possibility of doing your duty right so you had to you had the right to um, to to demand the conditions to to do your duty in a sense. If you didn't have them, you would think yourself unfree. So, but in 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 the, in the context of a liberal conception of human, for instance, <coughs> freedom is nothing is nothing but freedom of choice, right? Not not yeah. freedom to be able to realize a certain duty to your community, for instance. So I think what he's saying that human which is implied in the human rights formula is actually very particular to a certain western conception of humanity i think that's also a, a like a, a good reason to reject it in his point of view yeah that probably is definitely part of it so uh re the return of tradition and theology tradition Religion, hierarchy, family, and its values were overthrown at the dawn of modernity. Actually, all three political theories were conceived as artificial ideological constructions by people who comprehended in various ways the death of God. Friedrich Nietzsche, the disenchantment of the world, Max Weber, and the end of the sacred. This was the core of the new era of modernity. Man came to replace God, philosophy and science replaced religion, and the rational, forceful, and technological constructs took the place of revelation. <clears throat> However, if modernism is exhausted in postmodernity, then at the same time, the period of direct theomachy comes to an end along with it. Postmodern people are not inimical towards religion, but rather indifferent. 
Moreover, certain aspects of religion as a rule pertaining to the regions of hell, the demonic texture of postmodernist philosophers, are quite appealing. In any case, the era of, of persecuting tradition is over, although following the logic of post-liberalism, this will likely lead to the creation of a new global pseudo-religion based on the scraps of disparate syncretic cults, rampant chaotic ecumenism, and tolerance. While this turn of events is, in some ways, even more terrifying than direct and uncomplicated dogmatic atheism and materialism, the weakening and the persecution of faith may be the chance, if the representatives of the four political theory act consistently and con uncompromisingly in defending the ideals and the values of tradition. Well, I think he's definitely right about that, that uh, this will likely lead to the creation of a new global pseudo-religion based on the scraps of disparate syncretic cults, rampant chaotic ecumenism and tolerance. And it will be an alien religion. What do you mean? Uh, and uh, you know, uh, a religion of about aliens, or like with, you know. Uh, this is actually rife, right? Like this is rife in New Age shit. You know, the mix between spirits, aliens, the occult, the and paranormal. History Channel. <laughs> yeah, History Channel, Ancient Aliens, all that shit. Uh, all of this is just like it comes together as a pseudo religion because it's not a proper religion uh, since it has no systematic elements it has no institutional possibilities uh, <coughs> none of these things can come together and you could make uh, at least at first anyways uh, immediately you can't immediately make anything like a proper cult of worship of any kind because uh, these are these are highly syncretic they are very individualized um, every individual yeah. has their own fucking view of whatever um, yeah the, the the idea of personal jesus right yeah <clears throat> continuing now it is safe to institute as a political program that which was outlawed by modernity and this no longer looks as foolish and doomed for failure as before at least because everything in post-modernity looks foolish and doomed for failure, including its most glamorous aspects. It is not by chance that the heroes of post-modernity are freaks and monsters, transvestites and degenerates. This is the law of style. Against the backdrop of the world's clowns, nothing and no one could look too archaic, even the people of tradition who ignore the imperatives of modern life. The fairness of this assertion is not only proven by the significant achievements of Islamic fundamentalism, but also by the revival of the influence exerted by the vastly archaic Protestant sects, dispensationalists, Mormons, etc. Huh. Uh, I definitely never considered Mormons as part of the Protestant diaspora, but uh, okay. Mormons are their own things, how I'd categorize them. Yeah, I mean, that's what I thought. But I guess to a Russian, like, it all just seems like the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, Protestant sects on U.S. foreign policy. George W. Bush went to war in Iraq because, in his own words, God told me to invade Iraq. Uh, uh, and if by God, he means Dick Cheney. <coughs> <laughs> This is quite in keeping with his Protestant Methodist teachers. Thus, the fourth political theory may easily turn toward everything that preceded modernity in order to draw its inspiration from there. The acknowledgement of God's death ceases to be the mandatory imperative for those who want to stay relevant. The people of post-modernity are already so resigned to this event that they can no longer understand it. Who died exactly? But in the same way, the developers of the fourth political theory can forget about this event. We believe in God, but ignore those who teach about his death, much like we ignore the words of madmen. This marks the return of theology and becomes an essential element of the fourth political theory. When it returns, postmodernity, globalization, postliberalism, and postindustrial society is easily recognized as the kingdom of the Antichrist, or its counterparts in other religions. Dajjal for Muslims, Erev Rab for the Jews, and Kali Yuga for Hindus, 
etc. Now, this is not simply a metaphor capable of mobilizing the masses, but a religious fact, the fact of the apocalypse. Mm, maybe. Uh, yeah. Since apocalypse just means a revelation, uh, it's not necessarily, you know, end of the world shit. Myths and archaism in the fourth political theory. If atheism of the new era ceases to be something mandatory for the fourth political theory, then the theology of monotheistic religions, which at one time displaced other sacred cultures, will not be the ultimate truth either, or rather, may or may not be. Theoretically, nothing limits the depths of addressing the ancient archaic values, which can take a specific place in a new ideological construction, upon being adequately recognized and understood. Eliminating the need to just to adjust theology to rationalism of modernity, the carriers of the fourth political theory are free to ignore those theological and dogmatic elements which were affected by rationalism in monotheistic societies, especially at the later stages. The latter led to the appearance of deism on the ruins of Christian European culture, followed by atheism and materialism during a phased development of the programs of the modern age. Not only the highest supreme uh, supermental symbols of faith can be taken on board once again as a new shield, but so can those irrational aspects of cults, rites, and legends that have perplexed theologians at the previous stages. If we reject the idea of progress inherent to modernity, which as we have seen has ended, then all that is ancient gains value and credibility for us simply because it is ancient. Ancient means good, and the more ancient, the better. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Of all the creations, paradise. <laughs> of all the creations, paradise is the most ancient one. The carriers of the fourth political theory must strive toward discovering it anew in the near future. You know, like the, the irony here is that, as <laughs> as you already said, Antonio, his procedure is firmly liberal, because I mean, there's the book from Harkheimer, the Eclipse, Eclipse of Reason. Do you know it? Uh, I know the book. Uh, I haven't read yeah, it. Yeah, the book. The book is basically <laughs> bastardized Hegelianism, but it's very interesting how how he puts things, even if a bit too schematic. So his whole idea is that once upon a time, reason was considered a faculty of ends, not only means, right? So reason was able to actually uh, come up with a criteria. Uh, as to ascertain the rationality of the content of a certain end. <laughs> and in modernity, uh, re reason was emptied of any possibility of being a, a, a faculty of, 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 of ends and has become only a faculty of means, right? And so this is the landmark of modern liberal thinking. Reason cannot... Uh, cannot <laughs> account for the rationality of any particular end. It can only help uh, to realize certain ends which themselves cannot be cannot be valued, right? And the funny mm -hmm. thing about Duggan is that that's exactly what he's saying. He's saying, oh, I want my back, my traditional society, and I'm going to use even God in religion that I don't believe personally because he clearly... It's like, we don't need to believe it, at least the intellectuals who are organizing. We only need to find it interesting to keep the coherence and, and stability of this new political structure that we are trying to create, right? Mm -hmm. So right. even God becomes a certain means to the realization of their political of, of their political agenda, not the other way around, you know? Uh, yeah, you know how that re that reminds me of uh, Jordan Peterson. Uh, uh, I haven't read anything by Peterson, and I I won't read Peterson because I don't give a fuck. Uh, but uh, from what I've heard about him, uh, is that Peterson basically teach, uh, treats God in the same way that uh, when people ask Peterson about like God, like he gets really really evasive. He doesn't want to say it, uh, like. He, he he can't fucking take a stand and just say, look, I believe in God, I'm a Christian or whatever. No, 
Like he always wants to like, make God in this utilitarian kind of thing. Like, well, you know, God believing in God allows you to do this and that, and you know. Yeah, uh, but uh, unfortunately, as he knows it, he will never be able to believe in God. So, so it, it seems that what what he's trying to create is a paradise for ignorance. Like, please don't <laughs> read too much. Please don't go too deep in things. Believe in God. Believe in family, and you're going to have a nice life. And be careful with what they vitamin. teach in universities. Actually. But they don't teach in university <laughs> to be careful with Vicodin, right? <laughs> but but it's interesting. Like it's it's very it's very funny because these guys they're actually they're actually trying to <laughs> conceive of a certain fourth political movement, but they know that it's all bullshit in the end. It's all used only to ascertain the value of family tradition and hierarchy. Why? I don't know. But it's all bullshit, you know? But it's also, it seems that there is implicit here also a division of knowledge in which the most enlightened um, uh, members of that society know that the foundation, foundational myth that would make people actually comply to that society are a lie. You know, because because it, it, the way he's speaking here, it, it is as if you come and say, "Hey guys, how are you?" So we have this cool myth that I came up with. So let's everybody believe me, believe in it, so we can have a proper social cohesion. What the fuck, dude? That's not how things work. People need to actually, immediately, believe in something. As to, to 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 that something have some some effects, real effects on their behaviors, right? It's not as if a, I'm going to pretend that I believe in this archaic myth. Why? Because I'm a conservative, you know, of a new kind, and I think that's good for social cohesion. What? That's not not going to happen, dude. You will need to have a, a good amount, a good parcel of, of that society that actually believes, irreflective on those myths. You know? Yeah, I'm not sure that uh, we could say like he's lying, uh, but uh, I mean, because because this is like part of just like part part and parcel to to what happens with the uh, post majority, anyways, right? Uh, in which uh, the narrative is unjustifiable. Uh, and they think you could you can still be honest with it to a certain extent, but yeah. uh, it will never like you know it's it's never going to rationally satisfy because reason itself is unsatisfactory, uh, and yeah. so they they just give up on it. Yeah, yeah, it's like an uh, Duggan himself has already like a mark of a deep mark of liberalism, which is this uh, like distance, you know. Uh, this ironic uh, relationship with religion, right? Uh, in which you simply go and take these elements of archaic past because you think this is good to keep people uh, bounded to, to, to society and stuff like that, and, and not simply some. Anyway, I, I think we can continue, but it's it's very funny what's going on here, man. So Heidegger and the event. Era ignis, or era ignis, I don't know. And finally, we can identify the most profound ontological foundation of the fourth political theory. Here, we should pay attention not only to the theologies and mythologies, but also to the reflective philosophical experience of one particular thinker who had made a unique attempt of constructing a fundamental ontology, the most summarizing, paradoxical, profound, and penetrating study of being. I am talking about Martin Heidegger. A brief description of Heidegger's concept is as follows. At the dawn of philosophical thought, people, more specifically Europeans, even more specifically the Greeks, raised the question of being as the focal point of their thinking. But by thematizing it, they risked getting confused by the nuances of the complicated relationship between being and thought, between pure being, sign, and its expression in existence, a being, sein between human being in the world, Dasein, being there, and being in itself, Sein. (coughs) 
This failure already occurred in the teaching of Heraclitus about the, the Phusis and the Logos. Next, it is obvious in Parmenides' work. Phusis, by the way, is nature. Uh, next, it is obvious in Parmenides' work, and finally in Plato, who placed ideas between man and existence and who defined truth as a correspondence thereof, the referential theory of knowledge. This failure reached its culmination. This gave birth to alienation that eventually led to calculating thinking and then to the development of technology. Little by little, man lost sight of pure being and pursued the path of nihilism. The essence of technology, based on a technological relationship with the world, expresses this continually accumulating nihilism. In the new era, this tendency reaches its pinnacle. Technical development ultimately displaces being and crowns nothingness. Heidegger bitterly hated liberalism, considered it an expression of the calculation source which lies at the heart of Western nihilism. Postmodernity, which Heidegger did not live to see, is in every sense the ultimate oblivion of being. It is that midnight when nothingness nihilism begins to seep from all the cracks, yet his philosophy was not hopelessly pessimistic. He believed that nothingness itself is the flip side of pure being which, in such a paradoxical way, reminds mankind of its existence. If we correctly decipher the logic behind the unfurling of being, then thinking mankind can save itself with lightning speed at the very moment of the greatest risk. Quote, Where danger lies, there too grows the chance for salvation. End quote. Heidegger quotes Friedrich Helderlin's poetry. <coughs> Heidegger used a special term, Era ignis, the event, to describe this sudden return of being. It takes place exactly at midnight of the world's night, at the darkest moment in history. Heidegger himself constantly vacillated as to whether this point had been reached or not quite yet. The eternal not yet. Heidegger's philosophy may prove to be that central axis threading everything around it, ranging from the reconceived second and third political theories to the return of theology and mythology. Thus, at the heart of the fourth political theory, at this magnetic center, lies the trajectory of approaching Eregnus, the event, which will embody the triumphant return of being at the exact moment when mankind forgets about it once and for all to the point that the last traces of it disappear. The Fourth Political Theory in Russia Today many people intuitively understand that Russia has no place in the brave new world of globalization, post-modernity, and post-liberalism. First, the world state and the world government are gradually abolishing all nation states in general. More important is the fact that the entirety of Russian history is a dialectical argument with the West and against Western culture, the struggle for upholding our own and often only intuitively grasped Russian truth, our own messianic idea, and our own version of the end of history. No matter how it is expressed, through Muscovite orthodoxy, Peter's secular empire, or the world communist revolution. The brightest Russian minds clearly saw that the West was moving towards the abyss. Now, looking at where neoliberal economics and postmodern culture has led the world, we can be certain that this institu intuition pushing generations of Russian people to search for alternatives was completely justified. The current global economic crisis is just the beginning. The worst is yet to come. The inertia of post-liberal processes of such a change of course is impossible. To save the West, unrestrained, emancipated technology will search for more efficient but a purely technical, technological means. This is the new phase in the onset of Gestel spreading the nihilistic stain of the global market over the entire planet. Moving from crisis to crisis and from one bubble to the next, thousands of Americans held a demonstration at the time of crisis with the following slogan, Give us a new bubble. Can they be any more blunt? Globalist economy and the structures of the post-industrial society make mankind's night more and more black. It is so black, in fact, that we gradually forget that this is nighttime. What is light? people ask themselves, having never seen it. It is clear that Russia needs to follow a different path, its own, yet herein lies the question of paradox. 
evading the logic of post-modernity in one single country will not be that simple. The Soviet model tried and collapsed. After that point, the ideological situation changed irreversibly as to the strategic balance of power. In order for Russia to save herself and others, created some sort of technological, a technological miracle or a deceptive move is insufficient. World history has its own logic, and the end of ideology is not a random failure, but the beginning of a new stage, apparently the last one. In this situation, Russia. Sorry. In this situation, Russia's future directly relies on our efforts to develop the fourth political theory. We will not go far, and will only extend our time by locally sorting these options that globalization offers to us, and by correcting the status quo in a superficial manner. Postmodernity's challenge is tremendously significant. It is rooted in the logic of being's oblivion and in mankind's departure from its existential, ontological, and spiritual theological roots. Responding to it with hat-tossing innovation or public relations surrogates is impossible. Therefore, we must refer to the philosophical foundations of history and make a metaphysical effort in order to solve the current problems. The global economic crisis, countering the unipolar world as well as the preservation and strengthening of sovereignty, etc. It is difficult to say <coughs> how the process of developing this theory will turn out. One thing is clear. It cannot be an individual effort or one that is restricted to a small group of people. The effort must be shared and collective in this matter. The representatives of other cultures and people, both in Europe and Asia, can truly help us since they sense the eschatological tension of the present moment in an equally acute way and are just as desperately looking for the way out from the global dead end. However, it is possible to state in advance that the Russian version of the fourth political theory based on the rejection of the status quo in its practical and theoretical dimensions, will focus on the Russian Eregnis. This will be that very event, unique and extraordinary, for which many generations of Russian people lived and waited from the birth of our nation to the coming arrival of the end of days. Alright, that's the end of chapter 2. I think that's a good place to leave it though. We've been going on for almost two hours. Uh, so yeah, I found this interesting, yeah. We should probably yeah. uh, continue reading this uh, and probably finish it then uh, at some point. Yeah, yeah, I would <coughs> definitely, I, I already read this, this book, but I would definitely finish it again. Like what I, what I find interesting is that I'm not much into geopolitical stuff, you know? And these kinds of books actually draw me to that a little bit more. I think I should. Yeah, I'm usually not interested in that stuff either. Uh, well, not that I'm not interested, it's just I, I generally don't uh, engage it. <coughs> um, but yes, interesting. Yeah, so for those of you listening, uh, hope you find it interesting. Uh, Definitely not a lot of stuff out there of people engaging Dugan, as far as I can tell. Uh, so, uh, this is one of the few places on the internet. <laughs> See you next time.